Welcome to Shuttles and Needles, an experiential weaving studio. Our focus here is all about hands-on creativity. Shuttles and Needles welcomes people from every background or profession, providing experience, space and support for one to enjoy the meditative and joyful aspects of textile crafts like weaving, felting and spinning. Thread Talk here, brought to you by Shuttles and Needles, is an initiative to interview and interact with experts from different fields related to hands work, uh, hands-on work uh, on textile arts and other crafts. And Magical Little Fingers, this is our first pilot episode and we are honored to have Ms. Padma Srinath here. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are planning to make this a monthly event. We also request you to provide your love and support to Thread Rock, thereby uh, which will also be endorsing uh, working with hands and its importance. So I'm happy to introduce again Ms. Uh, Padma Srinath, a you. renowned early childhood development specialist. She strongly believes in following children's development needs to draft a curriculum which is more effective and valuable to, uh, to which is more uh, effective and valuable. To share a little about her, she's uh, moved to Chennai post uh, her marriage uh, and uh, a, a small statement by a late famed Dr. B. Ramamurthy, a neurosurgeon, is what brought her to this uh, field actually. Uh, the statement goes, the body has indicator to affect optimal development. So that's what's led her on this path. So she be, uh, she's been in this field for at least five decades now. So we feel like there's nobody, no better person to actually uh, be having a conversation with on child development. A very warm welcome thank and, and uh, thank, thank you for accepting to this. Thank you, thank you, thanks so much. Yes, it began with my um, going into Dr. Ramurthy's office because somebody asked me, we have a cerebral palsy child and what do we do with him? Uh, you know, he stays in one place, other children are running about, so how do we deal with him? I had no experience, I had normal children, so it was none in the family either. So it was very hard for me to say, yes, I can do it. So I just walked into Dr. Amoti's office and I said, how would you advise somebody to, who's being given this offer? He just asked me, do you have children? I said, yes, I have a daughter. That's enough, he said. I said, how do you... What do you mean? She's normal, I said. He said, doesn't matter. All you need are eyes that observe a child intensi intensively and non-judgmentally. You're not here. Oh, I'm sorry. So he said the, the, uh, the non-judgmental comes by not having a curriculum dictated by somebody sitting in Delhi for your three-year-old child because no one better than who's handling the child knows how that child's authentic needs and that's what you've got to get. So that's where I ventured into this field without at that time having a degree in the field but I went on, I went on to acquire whatever it takes but I still stand on that little pinnacle which Dr. Ramurthy gave me saying that observe a child and you'll get some suggestions. That's what took me to Magical Fingers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, like how we've uh, named it Magical Little Fingers, I want to start with a question asking why is there magic in fingers? If you can, uh, That's interesting. I think if some of you try to tie off your hands for a little while, even one hour a day and see how much can you do without those fingers. Can you even imagine that, right? That's one way of thinking of it, a simple way of thinking of it. But the reason I think the ma fingers are magical is that the same fingers which mold a pot can also use, wield those, that tiny little needle which is so fine and make one of those uh, curry work uh, kurtas or whatever that are famed right from Nur Jahan's time who introduced curry work today. And what facilitates that? Fingers. Somebody who's had an amputated fingers can't go in for curry work except if you decide to replace all that work with a robo. And that's not what I'm aiming at. So I've also wanted to extend that. What do you think facilitates uh, creativity, the heart or the brain? Because we've had uh, similar conversations before and 
There's huge connection. The body in itself is a multi-connecting organism. Absolutely multi-connecting. Something happens at your feet, you can probably feel it on your tongue. Right? But the vital organ of the brain is an equivalent of a modem. You cannot make a call with a modem. But without a modem, your instrument is useless. So there's a combo which facilitates you reaching out to the World Wide Web, which is the phone, but it uses the, com uh, the modem as the processing dimension to facilitate the call. So that your call to England doesn't go to Russia or Ukraine or wherever. Therefore, how does this connect happen? Because it's the joy of the heart that triggers the brain centers to proceed in putting in an effort to what you are doing. And without that joy, the communication is limited, the participating is limited, the facilitating of anything that we are curious about. If I ask two of you to even sing, now come here and can you sing a prayer, I doubt any of you will immediately put your hands up. Right? But anybody who is a singer who gets joy from it will say, I am coming in front. As simple as that. So the heart and the brain has that kind of a connection which makes for doing something as well as deriving joy from it. Yeah. Very nicely put saying uh, brain being the modem and heart yes. being the instrument. Uh, coming to kids, which is our topic today. Um, Just to finish up that little bit, I think we all know that if somebody is brain dead, we can still use their organs. The heart is still keeping it alive. <laughs> Very nicely put it. Thank you. Uh, so coming to kids, uh, what do you think is so critical for uh, kids in their early uh, childhood experiences or uh, in respect to whatever you've been talking, uh, sharing at the moment? What do you think it, uh, is critical for a child's uh, development? Once a child is born, he is born with the raw material of neurons in his head. Ten billion. If somebody told you, will you buy a phone with so many, so many, so many, you know, bytes or whatever it is, we are willing to take a loan from the bank and pay a monthly and get that, right? That's, that's the value added of something which has lots of bytes. We've got lots of spare bytes in the head. But they all have to be tuned in. You buy an instrument, you buy a piano and bring it home, it wouldn't function without tuning. You sit with the violin, you've got to tune those strings before you can, it can start playing the melody that you are wanting to play. Likewise, the brain is raw material with all those neurons and they function through networks. And these networks are created through, and that's where the heart plays a role, experience. And it is that experience that we give right from birth, even from when we, you know, a little baby is born, it's a very common thing to put our finger into his little uh, four fingers and see him grip and it's a big thrill to feel that and all that. So we are looking at giving an experience that triggers connections into the child's brain and that's, that's the How thing. important are these experiences for a child's development? It's everything. Raw material is there and your experience, what the experience that you provide is going to make that connection. And how do we facilitate that? Like, uh, what are the experiences for, for an example or what you've witnessed do you think would help? All learning is experiential learning. Basically, when I say all learning is experiential learning, all the residual learning we get after we attend a school or a lecture or read a book or listen to a podcast or whatever it is, our residual learning is what has networked into us and it will most often relate either to an experience we've already had 
or to an experience that we would like to try out to see if it is true. So connecting this with weaving, what do you think happens when, when one weaves? Um, starting with uh, connecting it with children, let me put it like that. For children, therefore, a sit down for 45 minutes till the bell rings and I will teach you ABC it is as worthless as the, uh, you know, the purpose of what will happen with the ABC in the child's hand for that day. Because there's no experience in that. Right? Whereas if you take something like a weaving, let me even put the simple weaving mat that we give young children with newspapers or with papers to say put it in and out and in and out and then you start with out and in and out and in and then in and out and in and out and they weave a mat. Um, early childhood teachers here, have you seen the joy in a child who succeeds in such an uh, episode? And have you seen also the fact that they come back gladly to the class next day, right? And they probably will ask you, what are we going to do today, right? I think so that's the proof of the pudding is there. <laughs> so what do you think is the role of uh, weaving in children's uh, educational lives? Um, weaving per se, I think. Uh, for me, it has a lot of uh, value added. And it came from a very, very, I don't like to use this word and I don't mean it to be derogatory at all, uneducated weaver. Just a weaver who's, um, who's had national awards for the saris he's woven. And he spoke at one uh, little session that we had with him. And somebody asked him the same question, what is the value of weaving in your life? Okay, And he said, in today's world, the thing that protects our dignity is the clothing we put over our bodies. And he said, the biggest insult to somebody, particularly a woman, and that's why he weaves saris, is to strip her of her sari, even if it is the Pancha Pandavas doing it. There is an indignity there. There is a pleading to say, save me from what? Not from the one who's pulling this. Save my dignity. The sari just goes. I mean, do I have to say more that that's the value added? I think you've uh, put it very well. Uh, so, more about uh, the sensorial dimensions of weaving, uh, because you've uh, seen, witnessed uh, kids weave, and what do you think was the difference there, and uh, just about the sensorial uh, dimensions? Uh, more than just talking about what have I seen since I've been weaving, that's another part of the story. But if you take today's educational scenario, standardized educational scenario, the crayon box soon breaks down to little bits and there's not much writing children can do with it, maybe use it for coloring. But when we give them the inverted commas, formal writing, teach them to write the A's or the B's or the C's or whatever it is, it is a black lead pencil, right? As against, imagine children using multicolors to write their name, which would they prefer? All right, there's an answer from practicing, practicing people. But the value added is, again, what will give that child joy in making him do something that he doesn't yet know the value of? You're making him write a, 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 a as if it's a, I don't know what, but he doesn't know what is the value of this A, and you're making him write it. The least you can do is to give him colors, right? If you have such a scenario, just imagine a child putting thread after thread maybe in multiple colors and lo and behold, see what I made. That's the value of weaving. Whether the weaving is, is in a very formal setup like this or whether it is giving them a bunch of leaves and making mats or whatever. 
and I uh, want to know your thoughts about uh, Chinese specific colors, like how they associate pink with uh, uh, girls and <coughs> blue with boys, or just colorful rooms for kids and things like that. So what's your thought on Before that? I go to that, let me tell you about the weaving part in child education. The brain functions as two halves, the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And all of us in our considered education have been told that the right body is, you know, dealt with by the left brain and the right brain is dealing with the left side and all that. And I've just told you a little while ago that we need to put a network in place. We need to tune in this brain to create as many networks as we possibly can and in writing one hand is not used and as is preferred in our cultured culture it's the right hand which is used and your left brain gets activated which is more the logical thinking brain not the creative side of the brain thank you very much <laughs> for creating people who will not regard the creative side of life because look at weaving you have to do this and this and this and this and this you can't do this and then come this side and do this and come this side and do this with single hand you agree Kalyani it's absolutely split second moments where the brain's midline is being crossed and in all the brain gym exercises that they give for various purposes, normal children as well as others, they ask you to cross the midline. In one of the activities they encourage giving you in, in cultural parlance is to make columns by squatting in one place and going beyond your midline every time you go zigzag or whatever you do. Because the cultural importance is only that it crosses your midline and therefore it activates both the hemispheres which I think should be termed as the holistic dimension of education. Not the A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3 or whatever. A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 C kind of writing. Very intriguing uh, pointers ma'am. Again, uh, I'm repeating the question of uh, yeah, come back to color specific uh, choices. Uh, the um, range of the eyes in terms of recognizing wavelengths ranges from something like 400 to 700, 300 um, mu's or whatever it's called in terms of a wavelength, okay? <coughs> nanometers, they are nanometers, okay? Now visualize us on one side is black and on one side is right and right in between are all these seven colors that then break down to further colors. And if you are giving them something from a bandwidth in between, you are not stretching them to capacity that they are capable of doing by moving from the, uh, you know, best contrast of black and white. So when you move from black and white and give that as the first experiences, usually starting off at eight months and moving on till about two and a half years, the black and white is supposed to be very, very powerful in getting the eye to range, move in this range, 400 to 700 nanometers. All the in-between nanometers are included. So when they are able to get to this range, it's easily easy for us to tell them which is the dark pink in this, which is the light pink in this, and get that finesse. If you don't give them the range, you are narrowing their experience within the lesser bandwidth. And that Probably unknowingly, many of us are doing it, no? That's because we don't know what we do with the child in terms of range. So when we're talking about color, if you're dealing with under two and a half year olds, go in for a black and white. If you're dealing with the uh, next stage group, deal with colors, but also if they haven't had an experience of the black and white range, 
the 400 to 700 nanometers. Please provide it. Please provide it. A, a stark contrast that is given to us in black and white is the print. It's black and white conventionally world over. There should have been some reason, right? Even children's books, they're not printed in red or yellow or green or blue. It's always black and white. Look how pretty she looks in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, also your take on uh, weaving school curriculums, like adding weaving to their curriculums and how it might help. Okay. School. I think this might seem, uh, what can weaving do in school curriculums? If we are talking about holistic education, we are talking about educating all the dimensions of a child. All the dimensions, it's his ability to speak, his ability to read, his ability to think, and his ability to present, right? If you are looking at that dimension, then you have to use this body only to do it, right? The mouth will speak, the eyes will see, the ears will hear, blah, 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 right? If you are doing that, I think it behoves anybody who is in the field of education, particularly up to the primary school, to think of giving an optimal experience for every child who is entitled to primary school education by making that instrument which houses the education you are providing a better modem. And for that, Rather than getting them to do like this in the class and say, I'm doing the cross, a uh, uh, midline crossing, weaving is a pleasurable activity which will bring an outcome that they can be proud of. You can assess, uh, assess them immediately on that entire experience. And you have given them something so composite for their left and right brain to be participating. Can you think of one activity in schools which do this? Contemporary schools, traditional schools, conventional schools? I can't. Can you? Can you think? Which means that we are not thinking of keeping this instrument in good shape, but we are feeding. All of us have experiences feeding a child whose stomach is full, right? Right? I've seen that in children. They spit it out. So you don't feed this for optimization. What goes in might just go out from here. So I think it should be not just like Unfortunately, I think even PE is once a week or twice a week, but I think something like this which is going to stabilize the stabilizer should be done on a daily act. It may be weaving, it may be columns, whatever. But in, in weaving, you use the left hand as much as the right hand. There's a the big distinction there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, talking about working with hands, how do you think these modern tools, per se, call it looms for weaving, or any other uh, hands work, well, how do you, what's your take on these uh, modern tools for hand work? As long as it is not being done by a robo or a machine. I put this and it will push the sh shuttle and you will put the shuttle. As long as you are doing that work to, to, to feel from within yourself the multiple experience of the texture you are weaving, the colors it is giving you and a finished product that probably has its end use with your grandmother or your grandchild. All put into that experience of what, two days, three days it takes to make a mat or a shawl. Yep. Or just visualize that at the end of a year you can give your children this as a gift. Just visualize the child makes this and takes it home and makes an avaratri of just these. This has all been in this weaving center. That's a needle felted piece. Yeah. Probably to make that, it wouldn't take a child not more than half an hour's time to make something small. And they see a lot of colors. There's so much that they uh, sensories that's been activated when they poke with their uh, with the needle. 
and definitely not more than 30 minutes to make something like that. And you get, uh, I don't know how many of you think you can buy this in the market. I can't because I haven't found it. I think that speaks volumes for what the question you asked. So uh, my question is, uh, I have an older daughter. She's 14. I have a teenager. She does work on some textile art. But what would you suggest to you know, people in their teens or older kids, right, in terms of... You know, hey, listen, I think the biggest need is a supplementation of today's education with centers which will teach outside what is called the rigid curriculum. And if you can do the bit of facilitating their brains not to struggle with what is happening in a classroom content. So, those of you who are ready to have a little center outside of shuttles and needles for little children, that's your entrepreneurial daughter. Because we need those kind of things rather than look for a job or can I be the crafts teacher in a school or whatever it is. If, if, the, if the school is willing to make you a crafts teacher, have a little weaving center, small, big, whatever. Even if it is just bringing a coconut uh, palm frond and getting them to weave a mat out of that, which will take them further. Please use the left brain and the right brain. Please look at all opportunities. But look at things that will give the child not just a joy, but the participation will make him feel worthy. Hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is Andy. Hi. Uh, my son is nine months old. So I'd like to know when can I introduce this weaving? Uh, will you be able to understand all this? Uh, before the weaving for a child who's nine months old are the color dimensions. Start off with black and white. Don't start with you know, it's traditionally or conventionally, I should say, not traditionally, important to have color for children. You color room, make that yellow, make this blue, make this red kind of uh, stances. But no, you give him the range of black and white through patterns. So the brain thinks in patterns. So if you give him, let us say you've got a particular wall which has a black and white thing pattern, change it periodically so that the stimuli is continuous. Once he gets the range of color, he's got the bandwidth of what will fascinate him about using colors. Once he has that, I think when he works with paper, when he uses uh, you know, little things, for instance, you can make strips of different color papers and get him to make mats coasters, you can get him to make uh, patterns of whatever, you make a, a rectangular piece and out of that you make a house on a larger picture. So he knows his work has gone into a larger context. What it really does is that using his vision and his creativity enlarges a very critical ability of the mind called perception. This perception is something that the standardized um, text lesson written for children and the way it is taught in conventional uh, schools will not permit. Why? Because it is the creative thought processing that takes them like in a blooming scenario. If this happens in a class, we'll tell them, don't go out of context. What am I asking you? I'm asking you, what are the colors of the rainbow, right? So you are kind of narrowing them down, you know. But if you start using dimensions which broaden his perception, I think there's a lot that will happen. And let me tell you something, that among the many things that children are missing in today's world is making sense of the world around them. Life has shrunk since our days of uh, joint family system and the predominant nu uh, nuclear system. And tragedy is, I think, set in in the flat system where the front door is always latched so your child doesn't run away or whatever, whatever. The perceptive dimension of a different kind in somebody else's 
home front or in their mat or in their curtain, not there. And as I said, that it is the first seven years that the best networks are built in a child. And those networks that are built, which adds to all that happens within self, self-respect, self-sensing and saying, I prefer this to that, I like this, self-regulation, all that happens within five years. So lo and behold. Any, any other questions? I think the the canvas is the sky really. Yeah. 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 Today, um, emotional quotient uh, is a very, very, uh, uh, very much spoken about thing as a very important in development and nurture of children. Uh, so creating an emotional awareness, you know, um, or the life skills, nurture and development of life skills in children um, is being given a lot of importance, much more than intelligence quotient. <coughs> so can you please uh, tell us a few uh, small things that we can actually implement, you know, in our day to day with, with our kids? The fact that there is a very powerful connect between the heart and the brain says it all. It says that this intelligence quotient is what we see when they do maths well or when they can make a, you know, robo or whatever, drawing or whatever it is, versus the demand for a emotional participation is very minimal in schools. There are seldom any days spent on experiential empathy and compassion shown. How many of you would be willing to take your children from the school with permission of parents, hopefully, to let us say uh, a place where uh, dogs who have been thrown on the road have been taken? The school will say, I, oi, pay, oi, all sorts of stuff, right? But when a child sees an animal in pain, there is always empathy because it is very blatant. The emotional intelligence comes into play when this empathy is triggered and they can do something about it. You don't silence empathy. You allow them to be proactive because that is compassion displayed. Empathy is the feel and compassion is what you do because of that. You don't show compassion just because you saw a beggar and today is Saturday so I am giving alms. No, that is not compassion at all. Compassion is the ability to do something for somebody else's needs when your heart participates in it. And if your heart participates in it, believe me, your head will be thinking of multiple ways. How many of us have the courage to give homework to our little children and tell the parents, on Saturdays, can you go to a Blue Cross and see what happens there? We will give them the spelling of Blue Cross and a test to on Monday. Right? And we will feel very comfortable that we told them about Blue Cross. No. Compassion. Sorry. All that has to be experiential. All that has to be experiential. If you can organize, have a pet day in school. You don't have to have everybody bringing their pet and the dogs all fighting each other's <laughs> tails. No. Make it today's your pet day, your pet day, your pet day. Every day you have a 15 minute morning of an assembly with a pet. should see the children in the school that I go to, which is the Adiyarpi Sophical Academy. Sometimes my dog comes, sits in the car. 
You are waiting to go and feel the dog and touch the dog and whatever. He is sitting partly. So therefore there is a natural, I think, affinity to other things around us. The more we bring that, I think, into play in activating it to settle this compassion as a network in the brain, I think there will be more compassion. And I think compassion, I think in today's India, is the need of the day. Not just for animals and trees or whatever, but I think for so many people as well. Does that answer your question? Yes. The little things you can do are the, this kind of thing. But I have also suggested with the school that I work with to say that if every child brings a handful of rice on, let us say, a Monday or a Tuesday or whatever, and you give it to the places like the bee mad where there are animals which probably don't, they don't have money to feed them. If there is a rule in the house that the day the child says, I don't want to drink milk, is he willing the next day to give that bottle of milk to, the, to be mad? Because somebody needs it. The animal needs it. If you start working from those dimensions, they're bound to build on their emotional quotient. You can also do it within the school framework, depending on what the school environment is. I think it would be far more specific, because I'm with the Theosophical Academy. It's easy for me to say, do it with be mad because they're just a neighbor and, and stuff like that. It would be very nice to see the school ask the children to think for a minute of a camel that used to circulate in the campus, which had died. So stand for a minute in honor of that child animal, you know. I think those are little things that we can do rather than, you know, when we walk on a road, sometimes you see a dead dog and you say, come, 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 don't stand there, come. Do the opposite. I think that should give you a few tips. Yes. Um, sorry, another question. Sure. Um, don't have to feel sorry. Have to have, uh, so, uh, so we have uh, stereotypes. stereotypes. Yeah. You know, children should be seen, not heard. So the practice of open dialogue, you see, uh, most of our conventional systems, family systems, do not accommodate that. Uh, you know, we do not, we have a certain set of questions that we do not encourage children to ask or talk about. Let's say, as I mean, coming from what your, the examples you're posing, a brief, you know, we do not encourage uh, an open dialogue at home uh, with children. So can you uh, give us some uh, insight on this? Um, in my view, uh, this is something that even I'm, I'm uh, struggling with because I think in the last 25 years or so, which is another generation which has come into this stage which is finding it difficult to deal with these things, the tragedy is the narrowness of the arena to have a conversation. If you had grandmothers, if you had uncles, aunts, everybody in the house, somewhere or the other something will come into your ear and the child will listen and child may question. And you might say, shh, dalam periva pechu, you might say, but it is entered there, you will go and talk about it to the neighbor or something like that, a conversation will come. But I think today with only the nuclear family, where is the challenge? Where is the challenge? Even differences between spouses, we say let it be behind closed doors, right? Isn't that an unnatural dimension to be in? Because if the children don't see that even they are arguing, the mother wants something which probably she's asking for, how will they ever want to ask for? So I think the framework has to begin right at home. And I think it's a cultural <coughs> dimension. And I think, therefore, if you want to do something about uh, Talk, talk it out. I think the very nice thing to do is to have a bunch of about five, six children in whatever way you can, to share a meal and you give one topic, homework, and ask the children, six children, talk about homework. You will get all teacher descriptions in there. <laughs> okay. At least you can start that. 
okay you will have at times you will have uh, descriptions that say oh my mother she won't give me food till i finish my homework you know you you'll have you lap dimensions like that but at least you are giving them a space you know i um, i believe that those are completely absent so if you have a little weaving center craft center for children and you make it a shared meal as well to talk about whatever it is what will your mummy say when you take this finished product home each of them then you are encouraging and offering that space where they will have the opportunity for non judgmental commenting without the fear of being said this is oh i don't know what this is all about this is what you did in school is it to take kind of stuff i also think that as uh, parents of young young children you can demand that every week you have an opportunity for children to talk giving them any topic we have show and tell no as a concept but take it as just a theme flowers who is going to talk about flowers food who is going to talk of dinner time at home right you can you can be innovative in those ways i think okay i don't know if you get prick backs from mothers to come back to me then <laughs> but i think it's important i think it's very very important i think we're missing the line and i think pent up emotions always seek a balance in substance abuse and that what is uh sorry uh, <laughs> society has actually undergone a digital shift um so i mean today children especially post covid uh, they're more audio and visual uh, they're not hands on thanks to the zoom calls and everything so now i mean the parents were and the teachers were struggling with bringing back the hands on uh, so what any suggestions uh, weaving what can we do hands on absolutely we're sitting in what um, absolutely weaving all around us yes i only don't see a carpet up <laughs> yes um, there's one down there um, how do we strike a balance between you know um, what is digital and what is outdoors a lot of research which is being done on what has happened in the last 5 years and then uh, th- there's been a lot of statement from big universities who are doing such studies that the lag of learning in what it comes means the methodology of learning has suffered and will probably take about 3 years with concerted effort to reach to where we were pre covid in terms of the learning abilities of these children okay that's a tall order on all of you who are teachers that's a very tall order on all of you who are parents for you to demand the other danger of just having a you know visual or digital world which makes for facility yes you may use two fingers two hands whatever but i think it becomes an impersonal world how many of us would really like to go to a gathering which is in person how many would like to be married into a house which is in person and therefore i think it behoves upon all of us to break in person dimensions and as i have thought if it is if you're able to weave let us say something once a month small mat big mat toy make it a point to gift every alternate month to somebody so you think of a personal person then you make the in due course of time i'm fine i'm myself i'm struggling with ways of how do we bring this 
personal dimension. I think you need little centers where children can get together to eat together and talk together. I think you need little spaces which will have craft oriented uh, opportunities because I don't think it's available in school time because somebody will say curriculum is not finished and the poor first grade teacher will uh, catch the upper kg teacher by her scruff and say why did you not do it last year that fellow is so slow you know spend my 40 minutes with him thank you very much it will be like that in the post covid time i think but also because life is impersonal and i think that's what we've got to beat and i think there is nothing wrong in when we were kids we were into the guides and bulbuls i think kalyani will uh, all of us had to belong to somebody they, uh, to some of these groups. There was no question. So the school extended up to 5 o'clock. And uh, beyond that, you did something. You may have done some cooking. You may have done some stitching. You may have done whatever, whatever it is. That's absent. Everybody is worried about catching the bus. Everybody is worried that the parent will come at this time and you've got to send out. Schools are worried you have to empty the school by X time. All these make the space a little rigid, which doesn't offer personal bonding. And I think if we can raise a chorus, I think you can increase that in individual centers. And in that context, I think every locality should have it to facilitate people in the locality. Uh, it's easy for them to come to that space, you know. Rather than say the school, then you have to organize something, uh, somebody to pick them up, this, that, and the other. If it's within a space of their living space, and therefore, how many, uh, how many corporation sections do we have in the city? Any idea? 175 nourish. Then you need at least 175 centers for children. So nourish have more weavers who can do all that. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm not this. I'm not joking. And mind you, for every child, we have only a window of three years. We miss it; they become a young man. We miss it. We big, we miss the time when his brain is still ready to network. We miss it, and we miss the time when he's willing to listen to you and take a perspective of it. Because when he is 14, he would rather watch the Netflix. Challenging that is a little bit difficult for us teachers, no? So I think there's, I think it's a big cry and I think it's immediate because all our young uh, COVID struggling teach children who went on that, what online teaching where they didn't know what is a live teacher in touch and whatever, whatever I think we need that sponge touch in different ways because the school hasn't started in a different way to address that. We've just started where we broke and thought we're continuing, which is I think a sad story, but nonetheless. And therefore I think we can't allow that wasted few years for those children. We need to compensate it. We have a moral obligation to those children who didn't know what that COVID time backlog was. If he was a backbencher in science or maths, you would go to find the Baijus or the Bijus or whatever for two hours a week at least, right? Why can't we do that for young children? Why can't we think like that for young children, not to Baijus, to centers <laughs> of play and to centers of such in culture. And if the teacher who stays there till the evening is not able to do it, there can be artists who do it, craftspeople who do it. I'm just going to finish this up with a little uh, thing that I saw last week to tell you why magical fingers is critical for us to understand. There's an experiment being done in a particular, I think it is in Delhi or in the recent of Delhi, 
where there were a bunch of uh, diabetics who were invited to come and stand uh, on plates which were filled with ground karela, bitter gourd, along with neem leaves. And it was made into a nice thick paste and a certain amount of concentration of the water. And they were asked to stand on it. And they were told they can step out if they got a taste of it. Okay? And most of them, within a period of half an hour, found their tongues were bitter. Okay? So is there any doubt that our extremities transmit into our sensorial dimension, whatever be the experience that it is getting. And if the experience is weaving, you've got a creative child. Very lovely work, ma'am. Thank you all for your time. And let's continue to work with hands and also promote it in practice. So uh, thank you all for your time. Again, uh, we have snacks uh, and coffee out there. Please uh, take a look thank around you, the studio you, also. And if you have more conversations with ma'am, please, uh, she's available here. Yeah. I was so Hello. fascinated by these colors. <laughs> Can, have, you, have you all seen in school so many mm -hmm. colors? <laughs> so come back to that 380 to 700 nanometers <laughs> that our brain is capable of separating. You have to really use these. Really. Okay, I hope I answered your yes. question yes. meaningfully to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.